All right, let's get it. This is Nap Knows Buffalo, and we are officially a Casey List show. He is done until the end of the season. I know he made the announcement last week. Just want to mention it again for anybody who's like, well, why isn't Casey here? Well, I mean, Casey has been on and off for the last probably like three or four months anyway. So um, it, it's hit or miss with him and his schedule. It's just he's, he's taking his break officially on his break, except for with the bets. He's still going to be a part of the bets. So Manny, uh, we still have a winner on this show because <laughs> neither of us right now have winning records. <laughs> yeah. um, I, we can go over it again when we get to the bets, but it's me and you. I mean, I'm I'm average right now, very exactly average. You are struggling a little bit this year, but yeah. we got time. We got time yeah, to get that up. Time. Yeah. All right. So the Bills, they yeah. beat the Dolphins 26 to 11. Um, it was, I, I don't know. I mean, it was, it was kind of an ugly game. I don't think there was a whole lot that I was like, wow, that was incredible. There was definitely a lot of stuff that I saw that I wasn't as happy with, but I think there's enough things that we can pick out of for both sides, obviously. Just like, even if it's a blowout win, there's still things that you're not going to like that you saw. If it's a blowout loss, there's yeah. still going to be things that you liked here and there that you could pick from. So let's, uh, let's start with our likes and dislikes from the game. Do you want to go first? Well, I got to go with the red zone. They were a hundred percent in the red zone, so that's a that's a yeah. huge improvement. And we talked about that last week. That that was one of the things we didn't know what they were doing wrong, but there was something missing there. And I thought this game that was my thing that I wanted to see is how they play in the red zone, and they went a hundred percent. So I'm happy with that. So that was my biggest like of the yeah. of the week. And that was something we've talked about that. Yeah. I mean, each of the last two weeks we've talked about like what what's actually wrong with it. We talked about it directly after the Titans loss. Then yeah. we talked about it going into this game, like how can they actually fix it? I don't know if they did everything that we said to do, which no. is fine. They don't ever yeah. have to, but they were able to get it figured out. It was nice to actually see them once they got there because they struggled this week to get there. Yeah. But once they got into the red zone, they looked like that potent offense that we saw last year which was just beautiful. And I'm hoping that that kind of momentum can carry over because Josh looked really good in the red zone. He looked like that commanding QB that we know he is. And I mean, that, that little extra little touchdown run at the end wasn't too bad to see either, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, like we talked about it, that I, I thought they needed to, the play calling needed to be a little bit more of Josh Allen deciding what was happening rather than, you know, let's run the ball and do this. And Mm -hmm. it was, it was either Allen found the guy or he was running for it. So, and, and that's basically what I saw. And so I, I, I liked that. And yeah, I agree that he looked like he was the old Josh Allen in the red zone. So. Yeah, I mean, he was he was MVP level Josh Allen yeah. once he got into the red zone, just continuing his success, which I, we don't talk about this enough. They mention it on the broadcast every now and then. It's not every single week. And eventually this stat is not going to be able to be brought up. Eventually there's going to be a something that breaks yeah. the stat. But like, it's incredible that Josh Allen has gone now. He's in his fourth season and he has not thrown an interception in the red zone. I hope this keeps going through year five, six, seven. Like I hope it yeah, goes as I, long as possible because it's just it's it's baffling that he's able to do that when he was pegged as he's he's just a he's he's not an accurate quarterback and he's just throughout his entire career, despite his first two years not even being that accurate because he he struggled. He still was not throwing interceptions in the red zone there. So when it mattered, he still gets it together even when he's not at his best. It's incredible. Yeah, I think so too. I think part of it is his cap like he's capable of running the ball and I think that scares a lot of defenses. So they always have to play that little prevent Josh Allen from running it in and I mm-hmm. I think that allows him to get a lot of more open or time to throw the ball accurate where maybe some guys like um who like Lamar Jackson, for instance, as we all know in the playoffs last year, you know, you get under pressure, he throws it, pick six the other way, that happens. But Allen's been really steady in the red zone. So he has. Yeah, I've I've that was great to see. Like I said, hope that does carry over yeah. into like just literally the rest of the season, not just next week, 
the, the entire rest of the season. Um, my first thing that I like, because like I said, I do have a couple things yeah. for my likes. I liked just the second half recovery. I'll start there because the first half was ugly. There, there was, and we'll get into that more, but in the second half, you could see it didn't happen immediately, but things slowly started to develop and the bills were slowly able to get that offense going to the point where in the fourth quarter, you could tell the offense just looked good. Yeah. But to do that after having a really bad first half, I think Ryan um, from the 585 report, for anybody who doesn't know, you should know. But if you don't know, Ryan from the 585 report, he's kind of talked about like Josh seems to be like the quarterback who you know immediately. Is this going to be a good game or a bad game? Yeah. And up to this point, there's there's more games off is more often than not that that theory holds true. This was one of those games where had that here theory held true, like it would have just been an ugly game the entire way. Nothing would have been really good from this game. But Josh was able to get it together after the the halftime and really put on a great second half performance where he ended up throwing for two touchdowns, running for a touchdown, and just like I said, I mean just before when you were talking, commanding the offense. So I I really like that. And I thought the big part of that, which this will just bleed into my next like, was Cole Beasley. We've talked about Cole Beasley a lot. I know we have differing thoughts on Cole Beasley and his impact on the team and his impact on the actual game plan. We, we don't have to get into anything past that because we've talked about that plenty enough before. But I know you're not a you, – you were on the if they trade Cole Beasley, it's okay – wagon and I was very anti trade Cole Beasley. I don't even know why that was a, a conversation point in, in my opinion, but it was. And there, it's not like there was just one person who was talking about it. You weren't the only one who mentioned it. No. So it's not like it was this crazy, crazy idea, but I, I thought it was kind of crazy because of what he did on Sunday. Like he I think he just kind of proved everybody, hey, play me and then throw me the ball because when you do that, good things happen. And I didn't realize this until right. Like I think we were talking about it in the fanatics chat, but there was before this past week, there was three games where Cole Beasley played a lot of snaps and then three games where he did not play as many snaps. When he played a lot of snaps, he got a lot of targets because he is supposed to be involved in the offense for whatever reason. He didn't get as many snaps, those three games. And of course his stats were down, but when he plays and when he plays a lot, Josh Allen loves going to him because he is one of the best parts of this Bills offense. He's one of the most consistent parts of this Bills offense. And I I loved seeing, like, it was literally like third and Bs. Every single third down, it was, where's Cole Beasley at? Get Cole Beasley the ball. Because he was just super consistent, and he made that offense go from a wide receiver standpoint. Because I Cole Beasley, Stefan, or, yeah, not, sorry, completely had a, a my brain <laughs> melted there just totally <laughs> melted but like Stefan Diggs and Emmanuel Sanders yeah. they they didn't have their best game Diggs still got his touchdown he got four catches I think four yards but they that wasn't their best game individually no. No. Cole Beasley was the man during that game so I loved seeing that after just like up and down for him th- previously in the year yeah I think Sanders didn't even get a reception or yeah, he did maybe late. I, he was I, I, very I low. If, I think he might have thrown up a goose egg. Yeah, which is going to happen. Did, which which is going to happen. happen yeah. It's happened to a lot of good wide receivers. Um, I agree with you. I think um, I was on more of the trade. Beasley was more because I think you know when your team has a lot of depth, and I think they have actually decent depth at wide receiver. Mm-hmm. Um. I think uh, you can trade him because I think he's still valuable for other teams that don't have that depth at wide receiver like we do. And I th- I think you could have maybe used him as trade bait to get something that, you know, maybe we need a, another O-line or uh, another linebacker. I You know, wherever we're lacking depth, another cornerback, right, for instance. And so that's where my thing was. Obviously, you know, he's a great wide receiver. When we first got him, I loved him because he reminded me, he reminded me a lot of Wes Welker and Julian Edelman, kind of that kind of mold. 
and he, he you could see glimpses of that in in Dallas but he never got that fully opportunity to be that guy until yeah. he came to Buffalo obviously yeah I, I always I, like to say he went to the Stevie Johnson route running school they like yeah, they, they run Stevie similar Johnson, routes yeah and all yeah, of them are kind great. of similar in that yeah. regard yeah and my biggest thing was was his catches and his snaps more because Dawson Knox was out, or is it because it was third and Bees all day long? Like that that was my only thing. Like if Knox was there, would Beasley be that guy? And, and he could have been. Like I don't know. That's one thing when everybody's healthy, that's something I'd like to know to see for maybe three, four games and see where is this game plan going? Is is Beasley becoming more of the fourth receiver, I guess? rather than the third or is he becoming you know after Knox kind of guy I I think with with Cole Beasley I I think we just obviously we know for a fact we have a clear-cut number one the receptions might not have always been there so far this year but Stefan Diggs is the number one receiver for whatever reason he's he's not getting those same targets and whatever he started that might he started yeah. slow last year too. It was the latter half that Stefan Diggs really took over. He he I took think. off, yeah, yeah, yeah. But even still, like we know he's the clear cut number one. I think just the way this Bills offense is working right now, there that is- number two could be Cole Beasley. That number yeah. two could be Emmanuel Sanders. That number two could be Dawson Knox. Just depending yeah. on the week. Yeah, I I think they have that type of talent where you you have Stefan Diggs. You know that. And then you ride the hot hand. And so there's probably going to be some weeks where Cole Beasley snap counts down. Maybe there's going to be some weeks where Emmanuel Sanders snap counts down. Maybe there's going to be some weeks, and I don't think this is as likely, but when Dawson Knox is healthy, maybe there's a couple weeks where his snap counts down. I mean, you never know. I don't expect that as much. But I think just those three are just going to be interchangeably that number two option. Yeah, probably. And that number three and number four. And I, I don't think it matters. And because they can do that, I don't like the idea of moving on from him because I, I really do think that there is a large drop off from Emmanuel Sanders and Cole Beasley into Gabe Davis, Isaiah McKenzie, Jake Kumaro, any anybody else they'll put in there as a wide receiver. I think there's a massive drop off that we didn't expect. I, I think we expected Gabriel Davis to be in contention for one of those top spots, and he just hasn't been that guy this year. So I think there's a unexpected difference between those top three guys, and then you throw in Dawson Knox at that four, yeah, and everybody else. So I, I don't, I never really wanted that, but I, I understand getting trying to get assets back, maybe an offensive lineman. That's that's a whole different discussion. Either way, I loved loved what I saw from just Cole Beasley in general. And then the last thing that I want to say is the defense. It like. The defense was sneaky good against the Dolphins all game. And it's weird because so I I was at the Bills backers bar here in Columbus and people were like freaking out because the Dolphins were able to move the ball against the Bills in the first half. And they were able to still move the ball in the second half a little bit, but they never got points. And if, if you look at it statistically, they didn't really actually move the ball all that well throughout the entire game. They just would get like, a first down or two on their drive. And then they'd stall out and yeah. And there was some things that helped them out and whatnot. And there was obviously some plays where the defense didn't look as good, but as a whole over the entire game, they were like, they didn't let up a ton of yards. They only let up 11 points. Like even on a day where they didn't look their absolute best because they didn't look their absolute best the entire time, they were still great. Yeah. They're like they're statistically one of, if not the best defense in the NFL, still to this point in the season. So they can have those bad days and still look good. That's I I am super excited about that. Yeah, I give I give uh, props to the coaching staff. I thought you know Dable and Fraser and McDermott all struggled struggled with their play calling in the first half, and the second half uh, the Bills came out like a whole new team almost. You know, yeah. their, their play calling was better. Their defensive uh, coverage was better. It just looked like a night and day team. And I, I've seen this before where the Bills, I think it was last year against Pittsburgh. 
where I was watching with my brother-in-law and Pittsburgh was controlling the whole game, like the first half. Yep. And I told yep. my, I told my uh, brother-in-law, I'm like, uh, don't count out the bills. If there's one team who's very good at adjusting after the half, it's McDermott and his staff. They, they're, they're pretty good at adjusting at halftime and finding out what they need to do to fix things up. Obviously, there's going to be games where they, you know, the whole game just doesn't work out. But majority of the time, they can fix it up. And this was another one of those games where they came out second half. Fraser called a different game. Uh, Dayball made it more simple, I think, was the key, was making it simple and taking what was given to you and controlling the the line of scrimmage that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a great game call in the second half for the Bills. So. I think that was key for, like you said, the defense and offense looking really good yeah. was that adjustments. Yeah, yeah. Did you have any other things that you wanted to point out specifically for likes or you want to move on to dislikes? You know, I, I have to say the, the coaching staff was one of my likes because I thought they controlled, they, the game time management was great. Mm -hmm. the, the adjustments throughout the game was great. I, I want to give a little bit of shout out to the run game. I thought the run game in the second half also looked better. Uh, as soon as you saw McKenzie and Moss make some runs, it opened up the passing game too. They didn't have to run for 20 yards or 15 yards, even when they made it like a second and four or a third and three. Like those are manageable, uh, you know, first down approach. You get mm -hmm. those five to six yards you're making life easier for Allen and the rest of the offense. And so that second half adjustment by I think Moss and the O line and, and Singletary and Allen to an extent, I thought was way better as well. And I think that helped the passing game as well. Yeah. I, I actually, now that you say the adjustments and everything, I do want to throw one more thing in sure. is just winning ugly. Yeah. Like not every team. I don't remember who pointed this out on Twitter. It might have been it might have been Greg from Cover One, yeah. um, but I think he I think he might have been the one who pointed out like all those other good teams that had losses because they couldn't win ugly, and yeah. this was an ugly yeah. game. Yeah. And yeah, the Dolphins were not a good team, like they're just not. But the Bills were able to go in and get a win when it was just an ugly game all around. Yeah. Yeah. And they were able to recover. They were able to make those adjustments. They were able to find themselves in the second half, which is something good teams need to be able to do yeah. Yeah. because it's not always going to be a perfect no. game. The game plan is not always going to work out perfectly like it did against Kansas City. Yeah. Like it's, it's sometimes you're going to have those games where things just look terrible. Yeah. And you got to figure out how do we change things mid-game? How do we find ourselves? How do we get back to our game plan how do we play Buffalo Bills football yeah. and just beat the team that we should be beating? And they ended up doing it in a fashion that ended up getting them the cover too, which is wild. It was just yeah. <laughs> the way the game flow went. It was unexpected. Yeah. Um, so, hey, I want to give one special bonus like to Mr. 57 yard field goal, top three kicker, Tyler Bass. I've said it. I remember being on another show when we drafted Tyler Bass and we were talking in there. And they said, who do you feel like is going to be the surprise guy? And I said, Hoshka. Because I'm like, Tyler Bass, I've seen him in preseason. This guy can kick the ball. But he's and got he's a bomb of a leg, accurate. yeah. And he's pretty accurate. And it just showed it again on 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 uh, the last game. That 57-yarder, I think he could have kicked it from 64. Did you, did you see the it. kickoff? I didn't see yeah. this in game, but the kickoff that hit the uprights. Yeah, did you see the screenshot of that. Where yeah, it was I saw literally, it. I was gonna, so I was gonna save him for my winners and losers because he was yeah. on the list of winners. We could just he, throw him on the the because I mean, also special teams player of the month. Yeah, yeah. For I think October. Like Tucker. I think a lot of kickers like Zerline, Tucker. These guys get a lot of recognition. But I have to tell you, like Tyler Bass, if not already, is a top three kicker in my opinion. This guy has missed one field goal this year. Uh, mm -hmm. He was pretty accurate last year and this guy can boot it. And if you can kick like that in Buffalo, like 
you, you can it's, kick it's anywhere. It's really valuable, yeah, to be it able so to valuable. have the leg he has. And he did. I mean, last year at the beginning of the season, he had a couple – he had some struggles oh, with his too. accuracy. Yeah. yeah, he had two misses right at the beginning of the year. Yeah. And then he pulled it together the rest yeah. of the year. Yeah. And I think he only had like one or two misses the entire rest of the season. And misses are going to happen. Like even yeah. Justin Tucker, Adam Vinatieri, all of no. the greatest ever, they all like miss kicks at times they too. Yeah, it, it happens. So misses are going to happen. But his consistency, it's to the point where he steps up to kick a field goal. And I'm not like, oh, like can, can he make this? Is he going to make this? He's stepping he up there. It. And I'm like, no, Tyler Bass is going to make this. Yeah. And when he doesn't, I'm surprised yeah. because he's that good. And yeah. once again, just to get back to that kickoff, like – I know he had the wind behind him, but that ball hit more than halfway up the upright. Like yeah. that was potentially a hundred yard kick, just an incredible leg on him. So he is, he's I, such I'm a super big... thankful that the Patriots drafted Rowasser or whatever that dude's yeah. name was that yeah. isn't even playing. I don't, I don't even think he's in the league yeah, now. I don't think he is. Bad, some bad stuff with him too, but yeah. I'm so thankful that the Patriots just absolutely yeah. whiffed sure. on that kicker because then Tyler Bass was able to fall into the Bills' lap, keep him around for as long as possible. Yeah, I think he's he's such a valuable asset, and he's so young. Like, yeah. the, what is this, his third year, maybe? Second. It's and he's, second year. Yeah, second year, and he's already this consistent. Like, this is a guy who, like, McDermott has no hesitation to send Bass out. And that's yeah. what you want as a ki- as a coach. You want a kicker that you're like, you know, should I go for it? Should I not? Ah, he can kick a 60-yarder in Buffalo. It that also is- gives the offense the ability to play a little bit more aggressively when you have yes. that third and long and maybe you're on like the the 35 or 40 yard line where some kickers are like ah that's that's pushing my limit because then you're kicking i guess it'd be more like the 40 yeah probably 35 or 40 yard line because then you're kicking a 50 plus yard field goal yeah so some kickers at that point it's like oh you're pushing my limit with tyler bass you're like no if it's third and 10 i can still just take a shot i don't have to like obviously the goal is to get the first down always will be yeah. You know, like, oh, if we don't, we're not punting. We don't need to punt. We have Tyler freaking Bass. Yeah. He's going to kick a field goal no matter the distance, and he's going to make it because he's Tyler Bass. Bass. And so, uh, yeah, love that. All right, dislikes. I don't have as many dislikes. I still have a couple things, but we got to talk about the first half, the, just yeah. the offense in the first half. And you mentioned it a little bit already. It just like the play calling didn't seem like it was there. And I don't want to put it all on play calling because yeah. – it's definitely not 100% play calling. There's instances where the play calling seemed to be odd, but execution also just wasn't there in the first half. So it's not like we're going to, or at least I'm not, I don't know where your thoughts are on this exactly, but I don't blame Brian Dable a hundred percent on the play calling for the, that being the issue. I think there was some things that were weird, some play calls that were odd, some timing that was odd, like running on second and long. I still, I will forever hate that. I just don't like that move. And it seems like that's still been a thing that's happening. So I think we got to cut that out, but just in general, it just, everything felt off. Like if the bills were meant to, it felt like everything that each individual player was supposed to be doing. They just missed just a little bit too. Like it wasn't like anything was absolutely horrendous. Everything felt like it was just a little bit off to the point where the entire offense just looked bad. And that, that happened. So I didn't like that at all. And I kind of paired that with my second one, which was the running on second and long. What did, what did you have for your dislikes? First, I just want to say I agree with you. I think the, there was something just a little bit off. I think it was the first drive or the second drive. I can't remember. Allen was running and he had, uh, he had uh, digs coming right across, uh, like maybe 10 yards out. And he tried to throw it to him. He, was, he could have ran it for the first down. But he decided to throw it to him because it was wide open. And mm-hmm. he he threw it a little bit high, maybe a foot higher than Diggs could catch it. And Diggs was, had nobody around him. And you knew right then that there was something just a little off in the game. Because usually that kind of a pass, Allen hits all the time, straight mm-hmm. in the numbers. And Diggs probably would have had 30-yard reception. And that would have maybe made the momentum a a lot different for the offense had he caught that right yeah so i totally yeah, agree with you um but for me the dislike like if i had to really like other than the first half i totally agree with you 
I think Matt Hack is still like Hack. Like every game, he's like, when they go out to punt, I'm just like, please don't shank it, please don't shank it. And he shanked it again, and mm-hmm. I, I, I think that's going to be a problem, especially when it comes to later games when possession, um, you know, where the other team is possessing the ball, like the the line of scrimmage, that's going to be huge with a punter who every game seems to have one bad punt. It, it doesn't, it's not good. So we, we mentioned earlier, winning ugly is a good thing to be able yeah. to do. Yeah. I don't think you can win ugly games against good teams. If you don't have, if, if you're just consistently losing the field position battle, the bills didn't end up. I don't think they ended up having no. that, uh, no. that issue over the entire course of the game because the defense stepped up and whatnot, but you're right. Like Matt hack, something is just, I don't know. It's, I I don't love watching him punt Tyler Bass and Reed Ferguson are extremely complimentary of him in terms of being a holder. It seems like that whole operation is going perfectly, but him punting, which is his main job. Yeah. It's, I don't, it's just a little, it's off. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not where you want it to be. So I agree with, I agree with you there. And it's, it's, an interesting situation because the Bills did sign him to a three-year deal. I don't know if Brandon Bean put any potential outs in it, so that that's something to pay attention to. I like I, I I'm with you. I, remember, I don't love what I've seen from him so far. I remember when we signed him, Kevin, who's the the Buffalo Fanatics uh, Miami Dolphins fan. I remember talking to him, and he he questioned it too because he obviously he got to see him a lot, and he told me that. You know, there are games where you're going to be like, why do we have him as a punter? Uh-huh. Like he, he has some great, he's good. I believe Kevin told me that, and I could be wrong, and Kevin will probably, if he watches this, he'll probably correct me. But I think he's very good at pinning the teams in that 10-yard line. Uh, uh, if if the Bills line. already have good field yeah. positioning, it yeah. feels like that's when he's the best punter he can be. But yeah. he doesn't flip the field. I, I remember hearing yeah. Joe Marino talk about that. Yeah, and I remember Kevin talking about that, that, you know, there's every game you're going to see a, a, a puzzling kind of kick and you're just like, really? <laughs> like, that's what you do? And it could cost us. Like, there potentially it could cost us in a game where it's tight and he shanks a putt and all of a sudden they got last ball and they're driving it down. And so it is a little bit of a concern. It's not as much because we don't punt it much. I don't yeah. think we punted as much as other teams, but it could potentially in the long run cost us. So Yeah, yeah, it definitely could. I think the other the only other thing I would put on there for dislikes um is the lack of pass rush. It's this pass rush is so I, I don't I don't even know the word to use it's for it. It's it, I guess it's inconsistent. Yeah. yeah inconsistent yeah. is probably the best word to use for it because there's moments where the pass rush has looked incredible. It looked like investing in the defensive line worked. And then there's games where, like, the reason Tua looked as good as he did in moments, because there was moments, I will not say he looked good the entire game, but in moments, the reason he looked as good as he did sometimes is because he just had a clean pocket. Now, there were some things, there was a, and people pointed this out on Twitter, but there was the very clear hands of the face penalty that did not get called against. I don't remember who it was, but it, it was going up against Gregory Rousseau. Helmet just like completely came off. So who knows? Maybe there's other things that are factoring on this consistently. But I think the issue is more just like, what, how, why can we not get this pass rush going? Because we've put a lot of effort into, into rebuilding it. I know the guys are young, but at some point I want to see that return. I'm not expecting Greg Rousseau to have incredible plays every single game. I'm not expecting AJ Epinesa or, or even like the older guys, Jerry Hughes, Mario Addison. I'm not expecting them to have incredible plays every single game. And I think it was Jerry Hughes that had the forced fumble at the end. Mm-hmm. But like, I want to see more consistency where it's not like the high of that first Dolphins game versus the low of some other games that we've seen. I just I would much rather the, the defensive line be – consistent in yeah we get after the quarterback maybe we get a sack or two every game we don't have those big like seven sack games but we also don't have those games where we don't get pressure at all like just find that middle ground where you like i don't know i i I, it's frustrating watching them because you know they have the talent yeah they do and 
I've seen them like even last game, I saw them, you know, pushing that offensive line back towards Tua, but it mm-hmm. seemed like they just couldn't finish it, you know, like th- find that like one little step to get behind yeah. them. They were pushing people back into Tua, but they just couldn't make that one extra move to get around mm-hmm. the guy, right? So, yeah, that's a little concerning. Maybe it's just, you know, young guys still trying to learn how to get by people and, you know, using their hands properly. But, you know, they got Star and, like you said, Mario and Jerry. And, you know, they, they part of their job is coaching those young guys, right? It, it yeah. is a play, but it is also coaching those guys to help them and the players, uh, the, the players they're coaching, to get that extra step so yeah i agree with you i i did see the push i just didn't see that one extra move to get that uh, open space yeah oh you know what one thing we didn't mention in the likes and the we we just talked about the defensive line not really getting as much push and not being as consistent but ed oliver we we need to yeah. at least mention him because yeah. of how well he played he he didn't show up on the stat sheet but ed was oliver was a monster he was he was the one guy on the defensive line that i i think was consistently and you put it perfectly there noticeable all game yeah. Yeah. and not in bad ways. Cause there's times no. where guys are noticeable in bad yeah. ways. <laughs> Ed Oliver was like, he popped on the TV yeah. almost every single time. Like if there was a play being made Ed Oliver was there around the play, he was getting that push that we were talking about. So Ed Oliver, we got to throw him onto that likes yeah. category. Um, yeah. All right. I think that's enough for the likes and dislikes. We, yeah. we, we, did a lot there, yeah. Uh, which is which is okay. Uh, winners and losers of the week. I I'll let you go first. Okay, so who is your winner? <laughs> winners, I honestly it has to be the winners of the backups this week. Uh, like Mike White coming in and doing what he did for the Jets this week. Like I mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but I sure didn't see that one. Didn't, no, none of us did. We all bet against him. Yeah. We all bet against him. Yeah. And, you know, we, it's funny because I had the team they beat as the winners the week prior. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they come out and just, you know, shit the bed, <laughs> mm-hmm. to put it. And, uh, and so I give Mike White, he had a fantastic game, 400 yards, uh, Cameron yeah. Marami touchdown, but he had a phenomenal game. So, I'm I'm curious to see you know there are these guys and 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 I know I Tom Brady's probably the worst example because I know he's a late pick but he's he's the best QB ever um but there's a lot of these guys you know like Russell Wilson was a third rounder these guys who are picked way after and they're considered sometimes afterthoughts and you never know look at Fitzpatrick he made a career out of being a 6th 7th round pick right and yeah, I, 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 I don't think he, that I don't think Mike White is on that path. But I will say, and I, I had I had qu- uh, backup QBs on my list as well, so I, I want to yeah. throw something in there after. But yeah. he made himself a ton of money. He yeah. he had that sort of game. I think it was Matt Flynn. He came in for the Packers on their last game yeah, yeah. one year, and he ended up getting like a forty Seattle. or fifty million yeah. dollar contract from Seattle. I don't think it's going to be the same thing with Mike White. But I think he just played himself into being always looked at as, oh, he's available to be a backup. We'll take yeah. him. We, we like, can live with him as a he's backup. Like, uh, Minshaw, he's right? Himself. Like yeah. Minshaw is that type of player. Like, uh, yeah. you know, he's always going to be that guy that, you know, he's a good backup. I think he'd be a decent backup for us. And I we're think like, like five, yeah. six, seven years down the road. We're like, oh, Mike White, he's still, he's still in the league. He's still a backup. Yeah. We don't know yeah. where he's played because he's been a backup the entire time. He's yeah. gone from team to team to team. But he's but going he's, to have a career as a backup because people can look to this game and be like, nobody knew him, nobody expected him. Look at what he did in X amount of weeks, and he's like, going to play himself into being a backup for his entire career, which yeah. is a great spot to be in. Yeah. And the, some of the throws he made, I thought I was quite impressed. I, I actually like like some of the throws, the back end throws. I was like, wow, that's actually. That's actually pretty good for a guy who's never played before. So I give him uh, props. I He was the one backup. Another was Cooper Rush, who played mm-hmm. a phenomenal game for Dallas. I thought he played that throw to Amari Cooper. Was oh, that was a great throw. Great yeah. throw. Uh, and then Trevor Simeon, who, like you said, can be a career backup. And sometimes you go, 
oh damn, Trevor Simeon, he's still yeah. playing, just didn't know what team. And there he was, you know, coming in for Winston and you know, played a good, consistent like he, he beat did Tom in Brady. Yeah, he, he beat he, he beat Tom Brady. Like, yeah, but he, he, even that's, in that's Denver, awesome. he he played that control kind of you know pocket controller kind of game, and he did that you know really well with New Orleans and beat Tom Brady. So I, I can't remember who else was a backup that played, but those three guys. Uh, I think it was sure those three winning. were the three backups. Yeah. So I I also had QBs on my as my winners of the week. Yeah. But I took a little bit different approach to it. I have my winners of the week being the 2019 Jets QB room because all three of them got a win. I don't know if you saw that specifically, but Mike White, he was on the team for the Jets in 2019. Yeah. He obviously got a win. Trevor Simeon, he was a backup for the I Jets know. in 2019. He got a win. And then Sam Darnold, who I still just I don't think he's all that great, but still he got a win. Like the 2019 Jets QB room – the Adam Gase coached Jets QB room. They all won this week. So winner of the week, <laughs> Jets QB rooms from 2019. Wow. Loser of the week, Adam Gase, because, I mean, that's just a bad look when all yeah. three QBs that you had on your roster, albeit not great QBs, understandable that they were not great back then either, but they all got to win. So yeah. loser of the week, Adam Gase, but not my official loser of the week. My official loser of the week, I, so I, I have three. Um, I'll do my, my – I guess I'll do my unofficial loser of the week first. Um, and my unofficial loser of the week is myself. And this has nothing to do with football. But I took the day off of from work Wednesday. And I took it off to go play uh, at the number one rated public golf course in Ohio. And it's been the number one rated public golf course for a little while. It's a consistent thing where it's always up there. It's one of the top public courses in the country as well, in the U.S., um, but not number one. But it's, it's a really nice course. So me and a couple of my friends, we took the day off. We went to go play, and we get there, and it's a little chilly out, so there's a frost a pause. Like we have, to, we have to wait. Um, I think we had to wait like a half hour when we got there. So tea time was at 10 o'clock. We didn't tee off till about 1030. But what we didn't know, and we assumed that would happen, what we did not know was that they were going to aerate every single fairway the day before. We had no heads up about this. And I don't know if you know what that is, but for anybody who doesn't, it's pretty much like you take a, you, like a pencil size or a pen sized hole out of the ground every like two or three inches, three or four inches, whatever the distance apart is. And it's the entire fairway. So there's just pellets of dirt the entire way along the fairway. We pretty much couldn't play. It was a day off of work going to the nicest course. And we just like, we, we had to do what we could to get around it. We were like brushing off the ground. Every time we were going to hit a shot, it took a little while to find our golf ball. So loser of the week, me for that. But my actual loser of the week is unfortunately the Tennessee Titans and NFL fans, because obviously Derrick Henry had his injury he is the offense for the Tennessee Titans. And like, I, I, I'm definitely not making jokes about his injury or anything. Like it's, he's, they're actually the loser of the week because they lose him. And that changes the course of their entire season. Yeah. Like what he does for their offense sets up, obviously their running game as a running back, but their passing game as well runs through him because if he's not doing as well on the ground, then their play action and the focus of the defense can turn more to the passing game. And then like everything is going to struggle if he struggles. So not having him is a huge blow to that offense as a whole. And like I said, to fans, because he is such a good running back that when he's not playing the bills, it's fun to watch him play. So the Titans offense, I'm going to put them as my loser of the week, just for the fact that they lost their actual workhorse running back. Uh, my loser of the week, unofficial, I guess, is me because I cashed out <laughs> a bet early. Uh, I cashed out a bet early of division leaders. I predicted all the division leaders before the start of the season. And I cashed out early because Indy had started off slow. And I was like, oh, this is not going to go good. So I'll cash it out and just take my bet and take it out. And now Indy looks like... 
they're going to come back and might even win the division. They, against they might be Tennessee. in a good spot now, yeah. So that's my unofficial loser is me for cashing out that bet because I had the Rams, I got Dallas, I got uh, – the the Bucks, I got Buffalo, uh, I have Baltimore, and I had Indy. So I had pretty much the teams that are going for it. So Indy kind of uh, scared me a little bit, but now I feel like crap because that would have been a good uh, bet to keep. Uh, so you're but, you're the loser of the week for pulling out of yeah, your bet. Pulling, yeah, <laughs> pulling out, pulling out early. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, winner, and then, winner. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, my actual loser of the week, I have to say, is Baker Mayfield and Aaron Rodgers. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, for the fact that this game, if they lose, could cost him the whole conference and the bye. And I think this could come back and bite him if he and he could potentially miss two games, not one. Because of yeah, how many well, I think he's. he's I think based on the days, he. Uh, I, yeah, it might depend it'll on when close. they play. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, it'll be. I it'll think be they close. were saying it could be two games because he has to. After he does the isolation, he has to show two negative tests in a row. Mm -hmm. And so that could lead into the second game. And this potentially, and we don't know how Jordan Love is, and they got Blake Bortles as the backup now. The boat. And the the boat. boat is back. And so this could cost, uh, you know, the NFC title for them in the first it, it round. Could, yeah. yeah. It could and, definitely give them some problems. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, I say, loser of the week, he, he's a phenomenal player, but, they, you know, sometimes – you know, you know that's a choice he made. That's his choice. Uh, obviously, we respect that, but it could cost your team in the end. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it definitely changes the way the team's going to play when you don't yeah. have one of the best quarterbacks in the yeah, entire you're NFL. You're playing Kansas City, yeah, right? It's totally it, different. Well, the he, thing I will say is like, it, you're not like you're not playing against the old Kansas City though. Like, I if you're going to have this happen against Kansas City. This is the year to have it happen against yeah. Kansas City. But, you but know, still, like, it's like you never know what could happen. They, like Kansas, Kansas City, City could turn on. Like Kansas you never City know. Kansas City went from playing Aaron Rodgers and the Packers to Jordan Love yeah. and the Packers. So it is a big drop off. We like obviously we don't know how Love will be, but it, obviously it's a big drop off. Um, yeah. We don't know if Devontae Adams is coming back. We don't know. You know, Scatling should be back. Lazard should be back, but it, it is. Green Bay has made it tough for themselves. Um, the yes, other they have. loser, I would say, is Baker Mayfield, and this comes to OBJ, his dad, uh, mm -hmm. talking smack about yeah <laughs> about Baker is, Mayfield. Is Baker and, the loser, or is or is like Odell the loser in this? That's I, I, I was trying honestly, to figure that out. I, I don't know. Baker, I think they both because might be. Baker, we've said it consistently. Now people's fathers are saying it. You are just is not his good father, enough. Though, like I, I have a feeling that his he might have his dad's password, he, and he, he might, might be the one doing all this might, stuff. He might. I don't. Well, know. Come on, man. Like, you know, like first it was just you know, it, everybody like Baker just doesn't have it. He doesn't like as he much. He doesn't. But Odell have, doesn't have it to the point where he deserves to be talking like he's talking either. No. But, so I. But the thing it's, is, that's it, why I think just, they're both losers of the week. Yeah, like yeah, Odell's not on. He's no, Kevin Stefanski said it. Like, yeah, the team is going to operate as if Odell is not on the team. Yeah, moving forward, Odell hasn't he's, been on the team. Yeah. He he's not on. The, he he was told to go home from practice. Yeah. Like he is but, not but there. He's been hurt so much. He's never either there. But my thing is, is that the word is just getting bigger and bigger on Baker Mayfield. I don't know why there's a love for Baker Mayfield. I don't understand it. I've never understood it. I guess his commercials are great, and people love his commercials. Yes, they're good. But he doesn't have it. He's, he doesn't have the it factor that Allen has. He he doesn't. He doesn't have what Mahomes has. He doesn't even have what friggin' Tua has. Oh, come on. No, 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 no. You've gone too far. You have gone. Okay, you, I've gone, gone a little way far, too far. Okay, I've gone Look, a little far. But Baker, you know Baker is a top he 15 quarterback. He is that middle ground quarterback who you know if the team is good, you can win with him. 
Like, but he's he's not, not the teams. carry a team type of quarterback. I yeah, think I think we all know that. So having one got, of your top wideouts just completely trashing you I, and his dad trashing you or whoever it actually is, it's it's not a good look. So I agree with you. I, I feel Baker's like a loser of the be week. More players that are going to come out and talk and trash about him. I don't know. I I, I, I I don't I don't think there is because I think teammates typically have been outspokenly positive about Baker. So I, I don't well, know I if I agree they, with that. But the, the, I just the, I, I think Odell is he's he's a head case. So it, it's a weird situation no, I get with it. him. But but like we used to people used to think Stefan Diggs was a head case. And now everybody in Bills Mafia loves him. And he, Yes, he, but that's you know, also like, there's also a difference when you've been a head case now twice because he did something similar in New York. It's yeah, not like sure. this is a first go around for him. He had his chance where he did this, forced his way I, out. And then he thought we all thought it was great, and it didn't. Like halfway through that year, or even halfway through the next year, you kind of knew it's still the same old old. Honestly, Dell. I don't understand the media and their Kool Aid on like what kind of Kool Aid they're drinking on Baker Mayfield. But I just I've never seen it. Look, I we've talked about this a ton. I like Baker. I think he's a good quarterback. I don't he's think a he's great a great actor. quarterback. He's a good actor. So maybe, I, that's that's kind of where that's we're at. Be. I, maybe you, I mean, he's going to look, he's yeah. going to make a good amount of money after his career acting or yeah. in TV. Somehow. Maybe he'll be the next Tony Romo. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. All right, let's get to the bets. Um, yeah. The five best bets of the week. That's what we have. Uh, we're doing Mondays and Sun or Sunday and Monday games. We're not doing Thursday night games just because obviously the show comes out on Friday. So it'd be stupid if we're giving you Sunday or if we're not giving you only Sunday and Monday, if you want to pick with us, go ahead. If you want to fade us, that's fine too. I don't really care either way. If you fade me, you're just you're you're in a standstill. If you fade Manny, you're doing great. If you follow Casey's picks, you're also doing great. If you follow Manny's picks so far, not doing as hot. So here's where the standings are. Right now, we have last week, Manny was two and three. Again, he's been two and three yeah. every single week for an eight and twelve record since week five. I went two and three also. I am at a 10 and 10 record since week five. Like I said, I am perfectly average in every single way. Um, that, 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 whatever. We'll just move past that. <laughs> Casey, three and two last week. What Casey would have said. He, there. he was, yeah, he is 14 and six on the season. Casey's having a phenomenal uh, season with his best bets. And, like the five and zero oh week really gave him an extra push, yeah, but for sure, uh, I mean he's been Actually, been yo, the positive almost. Ever, I don't. Th- I think he's only had one losing week, so yeah. he's I, uh, doing really well. I I'll have his say, picks. I, at least I'll say I'm consistent. You are. We're, look, we're both. We've all been I'm consistent because he's consistently been the winner. Yeah. I've consistently been two and three, then three and two, then two and three, then three and two, yeah. and you've been consistently just two and three. <laughs> yeah. So I, if you're gonna you follow know, Manny's picks, just pick the right ones. I, I always say, I think I have the biggest balls for picking the riskiest pick. You definitely you've gone money line a couple yeah. times. Yeah. I have too, but so, you've got, you've so, done it more consistently. So I I try to go for the big payout rather than the small payout like Casey does because you know yeah. he likes things small. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Jeez. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna keep doing that. <laughs> um, all right, I got Casey's picks here. Sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, all right, we we got Casey's picks. Uh, he he went with the Chargers covering a. They're going to cover two, so the Chargers minus two versus the Eagles. He's got the Patriots minus three and a half versus the Panthers. He's got the Texans covering five and a half against the Dolphins. Bengals covering two and a half, so the Bengals minus two and a half versus the Browns and the Cardinals minus one. I I never know when you have a team that's favored by one point. Why not just take a money line? I yeah. like. I don't know. Why not just take a money line? But he took a minus one, so that's where we're at. So those are his picks. I'm gonna I'll go first and then we'll finish off with yours if that works with you. Yeah. I I have six that I'm debating between. And I think I I think I just made it up in my mind which five I'm gonna roll with. I don't know. I'm betting all six, so I'll give you that extra pick afterwards. But I got the Rams seven and a half against the Titans. I think losing Derrick Henry is going to be that big of a blow to their offense where they're going to struggle. And then you throw in the fact that the Rams just traded for Von Miller. I don't think he makes a huge impact where he changes the spread, but I think he adds enough to their defense where it's just something else you got to worry about. So throw in the fact that like the Titans lost their best player. 
The Rams are just a good team all around. They're probably a top two, top three team in the league right now, and they've been consistent. I think they'll be able to cover a seven and a half point spread against a team that doesn't have their best player. Um, so I got I got the Rams minus seven and a half. I got the Texans. I'm rolling with the Texans, and well, I'm I, really happy because I put this bet in before the news broke that Tyrod starting. And Tyrod is Mister Consistency. He's not going to do anything crazy. But we saw the offense looked better week one against a really bad Jaguars team when Tyrod was in. Who knows? Maybe he gets that team going. Maybe they even end up getting a win. But I think at the very least, he's going to be able to help that team cover a five and a half point spread because he's not going to do what Davis Mills does. He's not going to make those big mistakes. And they're going up against the Dolphins. So I, I feel good about that. I like the Cowboys covering a 10 point spread against the Broncos. I think the Cowboys getting Dak back in the offense, they showed they can win against a good team because like the Vikings are a good team. They play up to good competition. They play down to bad competition. It's just kind of what they do. They're that middle-of-the-road team. And the Cowboys showed without their starting quarterback with a no-name guy in Cooper Rush, they can go out and get a win. The offense is that good. The defense is still very good. Like The defense is good enough. And you're going against a team that just they don't have it together. Whatever it is, they don't have it. And they just trade away one of their better defensive players. I, I like the, the Cowboys to just win big. Despite Teddy Bridgewater being a covering machine, I think that just I, I think that's out the window this week because the Cowboys are that good. I think there's a possibility the Cowboys could be the home field advantage team in the NFC. They could end up with the one seed. They're like they're just all around a good team. I got the Chargers two and a half against the Eagles. I'm I'm still sticking with the Chargers. They've cost me the last two weeks, yeah. but I'm rolling with them because I think at some point they gotta get it figured out. This is a good week. The Eagles, they just had their big win, just dominated the Lions. So I think this is a nice little letdown spot for them. And then the Chargers, they need that win. And if they're going to get a win, I feel like they can get a win by three or more points against a team like the Eagles. Do the Chargers have some issues? Yes. But they have a lot of talent also. So at some point, they got to get it figured out. Herbert's got to get it figured out. And their offense is going to get back on track. So I, I, I'm rolling with them again. And I'm just hoping they don't break my heart. Now, my last best bet, I have the Falcons. And this is so dumb, but I'm doing it. Falcons covering six against the Saints because they, they just lost their quarterback. And this is something where I, I'm in the camp of it's okay to bet on a first-time QB or a backup QB the first game. It's okay. Yeah. I don't typically love doing it because you're still definitely taking a chance. But I, I love betting against them the second game. And I don't think Trevor Simeon is going to be able to have the same type of game, same type of performance against the Falcons. Despite the Falcons being as bad as they are, I think that that team is just going to be able to stick with it. Cordero yeah. Patterson has been incredible for that offense. Yeah. I, like, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, don't, I think it's going to be one of those ugly games where it's just it maybe like a 20-17 to 17 game that – just kind of gets whatever. I, I think the Falcons can keep it close, though, because I just don't think the Saints can do what they did last week enough to score all those points. I don't think the Saints' defense is going to be able to be consistently dominant to the point where they can stop the Falcons all the time. So I'm taking a chance on the Falcons going up against a backup quarterback in the second start. The other game that I had was the Raiders covering a three-point spread. I'm not in love with that pick, but I, I I'm betting it, so I gotta just mention that. So it's on my, it's on my bets for the week, but it's not one of my five best bets. What are what are your bets? Okay, but before I say that, I think Taysom Hill might be starting for uh, is New he? Orleans. He might be, might be. So, okay, so he's yeah. he might be back. Well, I he put these all back. in earlier in the yeah. week, so whatever. So so just to either way, I feel comfortable there. with that. Yeah, I, I I don't think Taysom Hill is comfortable. <laughs> to be a QB. He's more of a, a catcher I don't, runner. Yeah. I, I don't think he changes the offense enough for yeah. me to change what I'm thinking there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it's still I probably going to be. An ugly game. He, yep. he might. It's not a hundred percent. Good catch. Minutes. Good catch yeah. there. So I got uh Pittsburgh minus six against Chicago. I okay. just think, you know, Chicago, you know, fields is starting to understand, but I think it's still a long way to go. 
I think the Pittsburgh Steelers are just starting to get warmed up. I know they trade away Ingram, but I think uh, Najai, uh, uh, Najai Harris has been playing better. And I think, uh, I think six points is not a lot against Chicago, a team that's been struggling for offense. Um, and they're playing a pretty good defense in Pittsburgh. I, I don't think mm-hmm. they're a bad team, and they're starting to get hot. Uh, I agree with you. I, I, I do think the LA Rams will probably have the number one seed by the end of this season. Uh, I have them at minus seven and a half against Tennessee. Like you said, Derrick Henry's out. Shout mm-hmm. out to my dynasty, Buffalo Fanatics dynasty team that has uh, Derrick Henry, and uh, may he come back better next year for my dynasty team as he's gone <laughs> for this year as i was dominating this year with him on my team i had him and josh allen on my team and mm-hmm. so i was dominating so goodbye to my team after this um but i like the rams man aaron uh, like yeah. bringing in uh they got a good Vaughn squad miller they got a good squad a great kicker you know shout out to the kicker matt gay he's he's doing great um I got Minnesota covering, as you see, I'm the guy, you know, like Kyle's average, as he said, he's always average at best. Uh, And then Casey (laughs) likes to win small little things. Uh, I like to actually take some chance, a risk. It's called risk. And when you take risks, you win bigger. If you win, yes. (laughs) I'm taking Minnesota to cover at Baltimore. Six points. So I think Mini has proven to be a team that can keep it close. Never mm-hmm. win. They don't win, <laughs> but they can keep it close enough. I thought I thought you were going to roll with money line. I'm going to be honest. When no. you started talking about taking a risk, I thought you were rolling with no, money line there. That was a little disappointing of a pick, I, Manny. I, I thought about the money line, but I said it's in Baltimore. If it was in Minnesota, I'd probably take the money line. But because in Baltimore, I think Baltimore still wins it, but they escape. Uh, a very close, a close one. Okay. Yeah. Um, then I, I agree with you. I think Dallas is just starting to get warmed up the way they played against the giants who, yeah, they're the giants, but you still got to win with your backup QB and the way they won. Uh, it just proves to be that when Dak comes back, they're just going to be even better. And I yeah. think they, I think they beat Denver uh, who's kind of falling apart now ever, since they're, hot start and uh, you have so, them at minus 10 yeah minus okay. 10 yeah. just want to make sure we got that right yeah. for the graph yeah and then obviously i got the buffalo bills and i know this will probably lead into our conversation about the jackson the jaguars and the bills but they covered last week when we thought yeah it might not happen and i think jacksonville is worse than miami <laughs> so i think yeah. i think my, i got them at minus 14 and a half i think okay. josh allen Let's the other Josh Allen know I'm the real Josh Allen. You can sit down. <laughs> and I think he, he kills them this week. So All right. I love it. Let's let's see how these go. Maybe we can get everybody to have a winning week this this week. <laughs> yeah, we're just maybe. we're still just hoping and praying for that week where we all are positive. Yeah. Um, all right. So you did mention it though, Bills at Jaguars. We are fifty-eight <laughs> minutes into the show and just getting to it, but that's okay. We did a lot on the the Dolphins yeah. game. Um yeah. Let's just let's just roll through this offensive game changer. I have a couple. I don't want to get in depth about almost any of them, to be completely honest. But I have a couple guys that I think we need to mention. I'll let you go first, though. Who is your offensive game changer for the Jaguars? I, you know, I was going to go with James Robinson, but it looks like James Robinson might be out. Yep. Shout out to it's my iffy, iffy there. Shout out to my Buffalo Fanatics dynasty team again because <laughs> I lost Henry, and now I might lose. Robinson do uh yeah so that was not good news for me but uh I was gonna go with him but I I think Trevor Lawrence is a key offensive game changer mm-hmm. I think uh him and Lavishka are gonna be the key guys uh what can Lavishka has been really disappointing this year a lot of media pundits uh called him the breakout player of the year that he might have a big year but he's just he hasn't been able to do anything. He's not getting the targets. He's not getting those plays like he was that everybody thought he would. Um, so I think, I think it has to be Trevor Lawrence. Like if it's 
Hyde and Lavishka, I got to think that Trevor Lawrence is the key. If these, if he can get going, maybe these guys can get going with him. But like, yeah, you know, it's tough. Yeah, I so I I did. Obviously, James Robinson. I think he is the most yeah. consistent player on yeah. their offense. If he's healthy, he's a great player. Yes, he, he he's is. been very underutilized by them too. Like yeah. just a terrible misuse by Urban Meyer early in the season, which yeah. Urban Meyer just. We're, we're not going to get into much about him. Just yeah. a bad NFL coach. Always wins in college. Will always win in college. Probably going to end up being a college coach next year. But he is just a bad NFL coach. Yeah. Just plain and simple. So I think the I Bills agree. have an advantage in the coaching department this week. Yeah. Um, I, I also had Trevor Lawrence and LaVisca Chanel on the list. But I think the main guy, honestly, for me is Marvin Jones Jr. And he's a guy who I wanted the Bills yeah. to potentially go after in the offseason. Because I think he's that good where he could have helped the yeah. Bills offense. I I love I think he's an extremely underrated wide he receiver. Hundred percent. And you you mentioned your fantasy team. I I have him on my fantasy team almost every year I can get him because he's not a guy I'm going to start every week. But he's a great guy to fill in on a fantasy league when he's you have other guys who are out. He's just consistent. Yeah. You know he's, you're probably going to get five to seven catches from him, and then you're going to get like. 40 to 70 yards from him yeah. and some maybe of those weeks you're gonna get a touchdown or maybe a really yeah. big game because he's a good wide receiver yes he, he doesn't typically make he doesn't typically make mistakes he just doesn't have as many of those big moments as those really good wide receivers have and so and, and he's an extremely athletic wide receiver as well um so i think he's the guy that i think the bills have to really focus in on Obviously, don't ignore anybody else on the offense because they're still NFL players. LaVisca Chenault, you mentioned he has all the talent. Just hasn't really put it together yet. But I think Marvin Jones is a guy who, if you don't pay enough attention to him, he can really have a big impact on the game. But Trevor Lawrence, I I don't know what's going on with him. I know he's a rookie. I know you got to give rookies time. I thought he was going to show up a little bit more up to this point. I think he's somewhere like nine touchdowns, eight interceptions. Nothing real great. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm he still lost, waiting for that lost. game where he just really pops as a player. And he hasn't had that yet, in my opinion, because even I, on those statistical games, he hasn't, it hasn't been great. Yeah. So I don't know. I, and he's a rookie. I, I, like, he's, he's a, a rookie. rookie. I think he's on a team that still needs to build around him. There's pieces still missing. Bad coaching staff. Yeah, bad coaching staff. That never helps. We know what Gase <laughs> did in New in New York, so we know what bad coaches can do around yeah. the league. Um, but I think also he lost Chark pretty early. That's yeah, a, that's a big weapon to lose early. Um, but I agree with you. I, I totally forgot Marvin Jones is there. <laughs> that's yeah. how much I follow the Jacksonville. Jaguars. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, I wouldn't have remembered that if he's not, if I don't go after him. I, you know, I've like, had him in Detroit. I so, loved him in Detroit yeah. because he was the guy that, you know, everybody double team Galladay and he would be always open. He was, he was Mr. Dependable basically yeah. for Matt Stafford for those years he was in Detroit. And I, I agree with you. He was, he, he's a great, wide receiver number two like he's yeah. the perfect number two receiver to have on your team yeah uh, he's he's the type of guy where like 14 out of 17 weeks 14 i guess out of 18 weeks well because yeah. it's 18 week yeah. season now 14 out of 18 weeks he's mr consistency yeah and then yeah. those other four games it could be like you don't know what you're gonna get yeah because most of the time he's gonna just give you that average wide receiver production. Yeah. And then he has four games where they could be duds or they could be incredible. And you're not going to get a ton of either one because yeah. he just is. He's Mr. Consistency. So I think that that yeah. covers their yeah. offense. They don't have a great offensive line. Yeah. Norwell, Andrew Norwell is a good player, but I, I, I don't even like, I, I don't know enough about their offensive line yeah. to go in depth about anything, yeah. but I know they don't have a very good offensive line because yeah. they decide to take a running back in the first round over an offensive lineman, which Which running back in the first round is always a bad move. Um, Defensive players. Who is the defensive player to watch out for? Well, Josh Allen, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I I only had two on my list. He was one of them. Yeah. Well, you know, Josh Allen's a high draft pick that they had uh, this, you know, and also the seventh pick. Yeah. Yeah. He was a high draft pick as well. And, you know, he's been pretty, you know, 
average, I guess. Above average, I would say. Average uh, to above average, yeah. yeah. He, he hasn't been – I he don't think he's fully lived up to that – top 10 pick just yet but he hasn't been terrible it's not like he's yeah. been a bust yeah and i i also don't think he far from aaron maben yeah like he <laughs> he he doesn't have a lot of help around him either i think yeah i think part of it is having a good full defensive line around you you know to help you but if you're the only one who's trying to consistently get there like it doesn't you know, it's not going to happen often enough, which is the reason why he's average to above average, right? His mm-hmm. stats show that, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think he is the key guy. And especially, you know, I don't know what he thinks of playing against Josh Allen, but I'm sure that inside of there, you know, the people are going to do the comparison, right? Josh Allen versus Josh Allen. I've seen it already on Twitter. People memeing about Allen versus Allen, Josh Allen versus Josh Allen. I'm sure inside he feels like I got to show up a little bit here. And, Probably, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I mean, if you if you literally if you just Google Josh Allen, he's nowhere to be found. Yeah, and he's still a good NFL player. Yeah, and he's just nowhere to be found because Josh Allen, Bills Josh Allen, the real Josh Allen. Yeah, <laughs> he's just been that great. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, he's, I, there's got to be a little bit there I for think him. You got to be a little concerned with him because I think he has something to play for to to be like, yo, guys, guys. I'm also Josh Allen. <laughs> Remember me? <laughs> you know, like that kind of game, right? Yeah, so I, yeah. I would be a little concerned there with him. Yeah, he was he, – so like I said, he was one of the guys. Miles Jack is the other player. Yeah. I think you could guy. probably name a couple of their secondary players too, some of their corners. They don't have like terrible corners. But nobody who I think is really noteworthy – where I'm like, oh, like we got to make sure we're not thrown to him. Like yeah, they don't have that lockdown not corner. Since Jalen so, Ramsey, they have yeah. So I, I, not like nothing against their secondary. Like I don't yeah. think it's just absolute trash. Like there's no. other secondaries that are yeah. bad all around. They're not bad all around, but they're not. They're not to the point where I'm like, oh, we got to talk about this guy. They're but team. Miles Jack is the type of player who he has like running back speed or wide receiver speed in a linebacker's body like he's just he is he is the new age of a linebacker where yeah. he's not this massive massive guy who's going to just destroy you with every hit he's not Brian Urlacher he is the new age linebacker that can cover wide receivers cover tight ends cover running backs and still be able to get physical enough as a linebacker to blitz and get around offensive linemen and do what he needs to do he is i mean he hasn't been as great like he hasn't been 2017 or 20 whatever I, before his injury 18, 2017 18. I think was his yeah. one those were his best years he hasn't been that as of late but he's still a guy who can disrupt the game plan yeah. so n- him being in the middle of the field him being able to do what he has to do or what he's able to do it definitely affects the game I think that's going to potentially slow down the running game because he's the type of guy who we saw Tremaine Edmonds has done this recently yeah. get through the gap and get to the running back of the line of scrimmage because they have closing speed Miles Jack has closing speed that can affect the running game. And when you don't have running backs who have the, like they're not speed backs. We all know that it's not yeah. at this point. Like we're not saying that as like a diss. I, or at least I'm not, I'm not saying that as a diss. It's just more of like a matter of fact thing. Zach yeah. Moss, Devin Singletary. They just, they're not speed players. Miles Jack has that closing speed that can make it difficult for them. If they don't hit the hole early enough. So that's going to be a, a thing I think that you have to pay attention to with can the offensive line open up gaps enough where Miles Jack and other linebackers have to pick and choose versus, oh, there's only one place for them to go. So Miles Jack is just going to meet you there. So I, cause that's, I think that's something just to pay attention to. So those are the guys I think on defense. Um, the next thing would be the Bills key to the game. What is your key to the game for the Bills? I think you establish the run. I think you still got to try to establish the run because as the season progresses, you're going to need that going into the playoffs. I think you try to establish maybe on first downs <laughs> instead of second downs sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I think you got to establish the run, be it with if it's Allen, it's Allen, if it's Moss or Singletary, whoever. But establish some kind of run that opens up the play action game because I think when. Allen does the play action, that's when Allen's at his best because I think he can find the players, he gets a little more time, um, and he has space to run. Uh, So I think it just opens up the passing game a lot more. I think that's key. And just keep it simple. 
if they're giving you the five, six yards, take it. Yep. Take it. Tire them down. Get those long, long, you know, eight-minute possessions, eight-minute drives, ten-minute drives. Get those guys tired that the defense by the second half is dogged. And you can really then start, uh, you know, killing them, basically. Uh, yeah, so I yeah think you could pour it on, on offense, those are the keys. On defense, you know, you know, rush Trevor Lawrence. He's a rookie quarterback. He's going to make mistakes. You got to get him pressure on him and pressure him as much as you can. You don't have to sack him. Well, the sacks are nice. But if you disrupt his flow, uh, especially with rookie quarterbacks where they tend to read one player often, and then they can't get to their second, third reads. You got to disrupt them right there, right then, and make mistakes because you know we're a takeaway machine. I think we lead the league in plus differential turnover. I think the secondary has been incredible because yeah, it, it's incredible to be able to have the takeaway difference that the Bills have. Yeah, despite not having the consistent pass rush, because a lot of times you have a really good pass rush that yeah. causes the Q, the QB to you know make get mistakes. the ball out quicker, and that's just like the secondary is just capitalizing because of how good they are. Yeah, and I think, you know, they're, I think they're at plus 13 or 14, somewhere there. Somewhere around there. It's first yeah. in the league, though. Yeah, it's first in the league, and I think you disrupt him just a tad bit. Uh, it doesn't even have to be crazy, but I think, you know, our secondary linebackers are, you know, they're playmakers. They're not, Yeah. you know, like, they always aren't the best at, coverage sometimes you know what i mean they're not but, the best they're not the best athletes you look yeah, at that like they're they, they're they're really playmakers players. they're really yeah. smart players they're smart they kind of know where to be where to you know like teron johnson tredavious like if you look at their interceptions it just they understand like i need to be right there they I mean, understand the, the what the yeah, the Poyer like that, interception to, yeah. to close out the game. He even yeah. talked about it, and this is something I think is extremely underrated because you mentioned like, they're not the they're, they're not always going to be the best in coverage one on one because yeah. they're not the best athletes or yeah. whatever. There's guys who are more athletic, faster, bigger, stronger, whatever. Yeah. But Poyer, as soon as that play started in the Dolphins game where he, he ended goes. up getting the pick, he he literally said like this was a play that we practiced, and I was like, oh, like I, I can't believe they're running it. Yeah. And as soon as he knew that, he knew where to go. Yeah, And I think every guy on this secondary is similar to that, where they just know where they're supposed to be. Some of them are better at getting there than others, but like these guys are ball hawks and they're, they're going to be yeah. there. If they know what's going on, if they can read the play, they're going to be there. But I, so I agree with you there. I, I even think the linebackers too, to a certain extent, I think Milano is a takeaway machine and you know, Edmonds has, hasn't been bad either. And I think AJ Klein comes from that, uh, that kind of mindset from Carolina when he was in Carolina. So you look at Milano, who's had a lot of interceptions throughout his career. Um, these guys are not the best athletes, but they're really, like you said, they're really smart. They they practice, they study a lot, they understand, okay, if I see this, this is where I need to be. And you disrupt it. Uh, Lawrence, you're going to have a lot of takeaways. And these guys who know where to be are going to, they're going to feed off of <laughs> Lawrence. Yeah. They are. They are. All right. So I'm going to disagree with you and then I'm going to agree with you okay. in, in a way. So disagreement comes with the offensive game plan. I don't think the bills should be a run in order to pass team. I think they should flip I, it. I think they're a pass in order to run team. If that makes sense. Like I think yeah, getting I, I don't you mentioned you like those five yard passes, get, just get the ball out quick, get yeah. the ball moving, get into a rhythm. 100% with you there. I think the Bills running game is better later on in the game once they've already established their dominance and then they can get the running game going. I don't think the Bills running game is as good early in the game and it hasn't been pretty typically. I think you need to, they get though. the game going at, they get the running game going as it goes. So I think that's where I would just differ a little bit. Not not to the point where I'm like don't run the ball. I'm never going to say just don't run the ball at all. I think you need to be able to run the ball a little bit here and there and then close out the game with the running game. But I think the Bills need to establish the passing game in order to open things up for the running game, if, if that makes sense. And if you I, do that, then the play action maybe it doesn't come as early, but the play action is still there. So that's that's where I'm at for the offense. I think just scoring early and forcing the, the Jaguars to try and play from behind is the move. 
Um, and whether that comes from having long drives that are kind of drawn out and you score touchdowns or scoring quick, whatever it may be, just getting that, building that early lead, I think that's going to be a good thing mentally for the Bills after playing in that tight game for the entire first half, almost three quarters of the game. I, where I agree with you is the defensive side of the ball. And I'm going to attack it a little bit differently. You you said get pressure on Trevor Lawrence. I agree with that. I think that's great. I think what the Bills could do to really cause some turnovers and create issues for Trevor Lawrence is they can disguise their coverages. We've heard other quarterbacks talk about, and I think Tom Brady was one of them, about how Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer, because of their ability to play off of each other and their ability to play within, I mean, the, the starting Corners and safeties for this defense have been playing together for three to four years now. They know what they're doing. Like this team can disguise coverages. This secondary can disguise coverages. And when you're going up against a rookie quarterback, albeit Trevor Lawrence has all the potential in the world, that offense, that offense does not. (laughs) It doesn't matter if you have Trevor Lawrence, that offense that they run is very vanilla. It's a college offense. It's not a great dynamic offense. So if you have those disguised coverages, they don't know what's going on and you can figure out a little bit what's going on, you're going to have the advantage. The Bills defense, because of their ability to disguise coverages and potentially get in the head of Trevor Lawrence a little bit with that, they could confuse him. They could end up getting him to the point where maybe he holds on to the ball a little bit longer and then the pass rush comes into effect or maybe the pass rush just gets going. But I think disguising coverages and trying to confuse Trevor Lawrence and make him make adjustments at the line that he's potentially not ready to make at this point. That I think that's a way that the Bills defense could force those turnovers. I I agree. I think disguising is huge. I think against a rookie quarterback, like you said, a quarterback you know he's used to college game adjusting to what is in the NFL is a whole different ball game. So I totally agree. The run thing, I might disagree. I still think. To get that confidence in your team that we can run the ball, I think you still got to run in the first half, especially the first quarter, to just tell Jacksonville, we can run the ball on you guys too. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and that's, that's fine. We, we know don't, what we could throw. Yeah. These are type of games like this and the Jets one are type of games where you'd want to be able to run the ball. Because if you can't run against these guys, you're not running against the big guys. <laughs> And that that's fair. That's yeah. fair. And that's why I th- yeah, it's just it's just different yeah. philosophies. Yeah, here. yeah. No, yeah, it's just sure. two different two different ways to attack it, I think. Yeah. Um all right, player predictions. I'm I'm going to go first on this one. Sure. I'll let you go after. Um I will say my first prediction is uh, Cole Beasley was on the injury report this week. If he plays, he goes for 100 yards. Not going to really have to expand on that because I think once again, I think he's just going to continue to prove his importance to this offense. And you mentioned get those quick passes. He factors into that. I think the prediction I really want to make, though, there's a situation I could see happening. I don't know what point in the game this is going to happen, but it's the Josh Allen versus Josh Allen thing that we're, everybody's talking about. Everybody's got to make something up with this, so I'm going to roll with this too. I think there's a scenario this week where Josh Allen has a chance to sack Josh Allen, but – Josh Allen jukes or stiff arms Josh Allen to the point where Josh Allen is on the ground and Josh Allen runs by Josh Allen and Josh Allen scores a touchdown. And so then Josh Allen is on the ground upset because he got juked by Josh Allen. And then Josh Allen is also in the touchdown celebrating flexing on Jacksonville, doing all that celebrating with his team and Josh Allen wins the Josh Allen battle. (laughs) Did you follow that? (laughs) That was a great I, – I I have to admit, that was a great prediction. And I could totally see that it's, happening. I, it would be great. Like, yeah, yeah. What, what, Josh Allen juked out Josh Allen. I, Josh I, Allen's right. Know, like, it's – there's going to be some fun things that happen, I'm I think, ex- just because of that. I'm excited to hear the announcers on that one. That, you would hope in that fun. scenario they don't mess up the names, right? Like, oh, what, who is – is it Josh Allen got Josh Allen? I think it's you James Lofton. It, I think it's the same tandem from last week from Miami's game. So it's James Lofton, and I can't remember who's usually with James Lofton. So hopefully James Lofton uh, does a good job at announcing Josh Allen versus Josh Allen. <laughs> uh, 
my prediction is uh, one of the running backs gets 100 yards rushing. Okay. I think this is the game that if you if we we want to see a hundred yard rusher, uh, I think this is the game that we might see one. Um, and the other prediction I'll say is Emmanuel Sanders. I think had a goose egg last week. He's not getting a goose egg this week. Big time he's recovery. Be, I think uh, he's going to be the leading receiver of the game for the Bills, and maybe a touchdown in there. But I love your Josh Allen versus Josh <laughs> Allen. I hope that happens. I was I, I was trying to formulate that. that the like uh, I was trying to like write it out a little bit to the point where I got as many I Josh, Josh Allens Allen in there as I could. <laughs> come to Josh Allen and say, "Who's your daddy, Josh Allen?" <laughs> <laughs> Just call him Josh Junior at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Like <laughs> Josh Allen Junior. Thank you for coming up. Yeah. All right. Um, over under is at forty eight and a half. Uh, the line uh, you already mentioned it is 14 and a half. Yeah. I, my score prediction, I think the bills win big on this one. Yeah. I, I don't even really think it's a close game. Obviously you have to respect every team because they're an NFL yeah. team, but I, I just don't see Jacksonville is just a mess. They're an absolute mess from top to bottom to the point where they weren't even giving their guaranteed starting quarterback for the year. Who's a rookie reps in the preseason. Like he should have been getting. So like they, they've been a mess from the entire time. Urban Meyer, I, I don't think he wants to actually be there. I like it's it's just it's a weird situation. Yeah. I don't know why they hired him in the first place. I wonder, they don't have a good a well run organization. I almost said a yeah. good run organization. <laughs> yeah. They don't have a well run organization right now. Yeah. I think the Bills win big. I think the offense shows out 38-13. That's my score prediction. Which means uh, the Bills cover the spread and I'm going with the under on this yeah. game. Is that right? So, yes, the un- yeah. No, under. wait. No, I'm hitting the over 38 13. Yeah, you're I'm hitting you're the over 41. Right. Yeah. Over yeah. and cover. Yeah. So as I said, I already said 14 and a half. I think that's easy for them. I think they're gonna hit 40 points this week. I think this is a game. You get a hundred yard rusher, you know, the you know, a big game from Allen again. Probably even a defensive touchdown. I could see that happening too. Um, I think they win big. They score 40 points. Uh, if I'll guess, I'll say 48 to 10. 48 is an insane prediction, Manny. That's an I, insane prediction. Yo, I hey, think that might be. Was that the exact score of the the Bills Broncos game last year? Yeah. 48 to 10? 48 to 10. Okay. And, uh, All right. We'll I roll saw, with that. I saw <laughs> I saw insane. New England played the Jets and I'm like if they can score that many. If they can do it the Bills can do it. Yep. The Bills it's, can do it too. Possible. You're right. And this they, is they, they did against the Jets and I think Jacksonville is if not as equal to the Jets, uh I think they should be able to put up 48. Uh, <laughs> that's a wild prediction to make, but I love it. I love it. Let's hey, get bold. Why not, right? Yeah. I got I got Passing touchdown, rushing touchdown. I got defensive touchdown. Hey, heck, Isaiah McKenzie, run <laughs> one in for a touchdown. <laughs> like, I don't care. This is the game where you expect them to go lights up. This is the game. I, you want to see it for the entire game, yeah. I, I think, because I think the Bills went lights out play. like halfway through the third quarter and on against the Dolphins. They played yeah. really well. Yeah. I want to see that for the entire game. When yeah, you're as much see- better – of a team as the Bills are than the Jaguars, yeah. just be the better team the entire game. Yeah. I, so I, I don't want to see second half adjustments. I want to see first drive go all the way, score a touchdown. They come first drive, friggin' intercept it, run it back. I don't <laughs> care. You're that good. You are one of the top three teams in the league. I would say three to five, right? Yeah, and I mean, I think guys, they're top three. I think they're just guys top three. Are the bottom three to the five. Yeah. Right. Look, so, I, even despite that, difference. I don't think I, you'll ever find me predicting a 38 point victory. 28, po- like 38 to 10 is probably the largest victory margin I will predict all year. Or th- I guess 38 13 was my prediction. That's yeah. probably the largest Look, difference that I'll go with all year. But I love, I love how bold you got with that. I brought, I have a brother in law in Jacksonville, and he doesn't even know what's happening with Jacksonville. He lives in Jacksonville. He goes yeah. to the games to just chill. They don't even <laughs> watch the game. This is what Jacksonville is. It's a, like you said, a poorly run organization that yeah. is going to move to London, England one of these days. 
And I, I just happen. don't want them to. I don't want any team I, moving I, over there. I, I, but sooner that's or later, a whole nother discussion. It's going to be – I don't even call them the Jacksonville Jaguars. I call them the occasional Jacksonville but London Jaguars. <laughs> and so that's how they are. Poorly run. Bills win big. All right. that's a Look, that's a perfect way to end it out. Yeah, perfect Look, way to end it up. Hashtag winning. This is, hashtag what this, winning. Week, this is what this week is all about. All right, hashtag winning. There you go. All right, Manny, let me get a go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills.